Okay, Booker Tov, everybody. Um, today's stuff is um, today's stuff is Pedalet eighty four. We pick up on the Mishnah, all right. And we this the focus of this parak as the as the uh, name of the parak itself says, as the first Mishnah introduced, is the, the altar sanctifies things that are put on the altar, even though they are invalid, get to remain there um, and get to be put on the fire, etc. Um, and uh, uh, so the first Mishnah was identifying what things, meaning not forgetting the nature of the invalidity, which is our Mishnah, but what types of things are connected to the altar. So obviously anything that was going to be burnt on the altar. How about things like liquids, like bloods and wine? So that was a debate. How about things that maybe had not fully yet been identified? That was that obscure case of the comets of the Mincha that had not yet put in the Kli. Things that are, um, um, and then you had the other opinions that only things that are animals, or maybe only things, or maybe you even exclude birds. You had a whole different thing about the, t- the, the scope of different things that go on the altar that are, that, that, for the which this halacha would apply, that once they're put on there, they stay on there. Now we turn to the next mission, which talks about the types of invalidities and which invalidities might be so bad. Um, you know, it's not like a moral judgment or whatever, you know, <laughs> so problematic in this context that the thing would not be allowed to stay on the altar. So that's this Mishnah. The following things, if they were put on the altar, do not get taken off. Um, halan, something that slept overnight, meaning no tar. It could be the meat, it could be the uh, the emurim, it could be the blood. If the blood sleeps overnight, you haven't even made the sacrifice valid, right? The hayotse, um, or the uh, thing was taken out of the Beit HaMikdash, it became pus again, whether you're talking about the meat or the blood or whatever, um, or the emurim, the something that became in tamay, the shenishchat chutz is manav chutz in komo, so the so wait, in alu lo yirdu, with yeah. yotze, it's already out. And then you brought it back in, and then you put it on the altar. Oh, okay, then don't take it off again. You never took it off. It's you yotze. had this blood, yeah. you stepped accidentally, somebody was calling you, and the other snush him, and you stepped in there to talk to them, and then you realized you were still holding the blood in your hand, or from the, you know, in the bowl. Yeah. Okay, or you're still holding the amurim in your hand. So now you go back in, and the, you're also you're with an absent-minded kohen, and you're not paying attention. And then you walk back in, and you put it on the altar. No, don't, don't take it off. it off the altar. Okay. Now those things for would have been had what the bro called before a shot hakolisher. There's a moment they could have been put on, and then something happened to them. But now we have things that never could have been put on from the very minute they became an like a non, an inanimate object. From the very minute the animal was shechted, they were already invalid. What are those cases? Um, you have a pigul thought, a chutzis mana thought, or a chutzim komo thought, a quasi pigul thought. These those invalidated from the moment of the shechita. Okay, the shekibu psulim is our questamo. A puzzle kohen um, catches the blood or throws the blood on the altar. Okay, so again, by the way. In these types of cases, the whole animal is pasul, or if a pasul came through the blood on the altar, the blood never legitimately made it to the altar. And nevertheless, right, you you put the rest of it, the meat or the emurim, on the altar. Even though the blood never legitimately even was put on the altar, it's nevertheless um, okay. You have a hard time with the pigo. It's pigo. I mean, pigo, it's okay. I mean, you can't get to say on there, right. But if you don't there. Right? It's just correct. It just doesn't come off the altar. That is correct. It does not achieve atonement. He has three cases. He agrees with everything except for three cases. And we're going to see in the Gemara, or it's actually more in Rashi and Tosfos, uh, why these three cases are different. In these three cases, it was shechted at night, the blood was spilled, or the blood went out. So the blood was spilled, the blood went out, the blood is never legitimately going to make it to the altar. Okay, um, Or it was shechted at night. In those three scenarios, um, uh, outside of the curtains, meaning outside of the Azara, in those cases, if it goes up, it has to come back down. So why those are more uh, problematic? I mean, I get it that the blood is never legitimately going to go to the altar, but it was shechted like chutzis mano, it was puzzled to begin with, you know? So what exactly, let's say it was nizrak damo, a puzzled person through the blood, the blood also didn't legitimately make it to the altar. No, but so I mean, why are those three the whole special? start, at least in Ishka Malayim, the whole start is off. Okay, you know what I mean, like Nishka Balayla is different than Shchutz Lisma. Yeah, because you were at least Shchutz Lisma during the day, and then you had a roll. All right, but Nishbach Dama is different. Yatsa Dama Chutz Lechlaim is worse than. Yeah, because again, you at least keep, started. Keep, keep, keep loop Suli Mes Dama. Right, because you at least started something. Like I don't understand. Keep, if you, a Kashuk person catches the blood and then walks it out, 
why is that worse than if a puzzle person catches than if a puzzle person catches the blood? Puzzle person catches the blood. No, the problem I'm started earlier. Fine, he's reliable. We have to explain all three. Okay, so anyway, we're gonna have to figure out what those make those things special. The Shimon Omer Lo Shimon says no, those three don't bother me. Shabbat Shimon, because presumably he's the Tanakama. But now we explain what Reb Shimon's. What? Where would Reb Shimon draw the line? Okay, where would the Tanakama draw the line? What psulim would he? You know what everybody say? They're so bad that it comes off. Shabbat Shimon Omer, Kolish Psulo Bakodesh, Hakodesh Mikablo. If the invalidity happened once you already were in the Beit Hamikdash, then it's an interesting phrase. Then the Kodesh accepts you, receives you. You basically got in the door, okay? And then we're not going to kick you out. Okay, obviously it's only when you make it to the Mizbeah. Loy of Sulo B'Kodesh, Eina Kodesh Mekablo. If the invalidity happened before the Kodesh, before the Beit HaMikdash, it would not. So wh what's the case that the invalidity happened earlier? All the cases we talked about, the invalidity happened in the context of the Beit HaMikdash. Even when a puzzle person shechted it, there was a Shechita that happens in the Beit HaMikdash. Okay, before that, until that moment of Shechita, everything looked fine. Right, everything was ready. What was was okay. All right. So, what's a case though where it was pasul already? Well, maybe they okay. had like a, a mincha, and then you had someone uh, who's well. Let's you know, he, let's look at an easier case in Mishnah. Um, the elush lo hayu pasulan bakodesh. The following things the pasul began even before harovea v'hanirva. If the animal was used in an act of, of bestiality, so before it was even sanctified, it was invalid. Okay, the muktzav and evad, something that was designated for a vodizara, or actually was worshipped as a vodizara. The esnan v'amachir, something that was used as a gift, uh, as a payment of a prostitute, or that was exchanged with a dog. Okay, all these things are invalidities that precede, you know, it even being sanctified. The kalaim v'atreifa, kalaim. Oh yeah, kilaim is whatever. <laughs> I get so confused. That was the uh, that was the line before about kutz mm -hmm. um, and Anyway, kilaim ba treifa and a crossbreed. Okay, something that's somewhere between let's say a sheep and a goat or something like that, and a treifa, an animal that has an internal uh, injury. The haya or you know that that would not be kosher even for non kodesh purposes. Vayotze dofed. And, and this, which seems innocuous, it is innocuous, it's more innocuous than the other stuff, but nevertheless, it's invalid. Something that actually was born by uh, by C-section, okay? It's because only an animal born by vaginal birth is considered kosher. Uh, it says ki yivalei, derech I have no idea. Uba'alei mumi, and things with a blemish. So all of these are things that the pasul pasul happened before the kodesh. Now I need to pause because while yes, often the pasul will happen before the kodesh, it's not just a question of time. There's also a conceptual point here because uh, the Gemara learns elsewhere that all of these things are also go off the altar even if they happened after the animal was sanctified. I sanctified my animal and then somebody used it in an act of bestiality. I sanctified my animal and then it got a blemish. Okay, I mean, we could go through the list. Some of them might not work because maybe after I sanctified, it can't be used anymore. And I vote Zara, it's like, hey, not I'm Oster, Dovashen, Shalom, you know, whatever. But we'd have to figure it out, okay? I sanctified it and then it became a trefa. All of those things could happen after we sanctified. They could even happen in the Beit HaMikdash. I'm right there with my perfect animal in the Beit HaMikdash, and somebody slips with their knife and makes it a trefa or makes it a balmur. Okay, nevertheless, that's called Lohaya Psulo Bakodesh because the problem conceptually is not what happened to it was not a wrong uh, mikdash ritual. It wasn't the mikdash ritual was done wrong. Okay, all of the earlier invalidities, what was done wrong were the halachas of how you how you do the rituals of the korbanot or where you're allowed to keep the stuff. You only keep it in the azara. You're not allowed to cross over this boundary and bring it outside. You're not allowed to become tamay. Those are all things that, are, that sort of were about <laughs> handling it as a sanctified animal. Whereas these types of things, even if they happened in the Beit HaMikdash after it was sanctified, right, sort of the thing that happened to it was not a wrong ritual. Okay, and therefore that's called Lo Hayapsula Bakodesh, and it's conceptually unrelated to the Mikdash. And therefore, if that if that animal was used, it goes down off of the altar. Rabbi Akiva Machshir Bevalei Mumi. Rabbi Akiva actually says a Baal Mum you can keep up. Now, why is a Baal Mum any better than like a Yotze Dofen? So yes, so the Gemara is going to say conceptually. 
you would think, you know, it sounds like he's saying all Bali Mumim are okay, but the question is, why is that better than like, I don't know, a, a C-section? You know, why is that better than something else, a trafer or whatever it might be? So the Gemara is going to actually limit it to a very narrow yeah, case of Bali Mumim. Thank you, Michael, but it's not, it's not shot in the Mishnah. Um, the Gemara is going to limit it to a very narrow case where the comparable type of a moon would not be a problem in a bird. And therefore, because it has some comparable case where it's not a problem, that would be okay. We'll see that in the Gemara. Rabbi Hanina's gun, Koni Momer, Rabbi Hanina, the, the uh, assistant of the Konim, said, Abba, my father, somebody mentioned the other day, I don't know, was it you, Hanan, that it's interesting that, you know, a lot of Tanayim, not a lot, but there were definitely Tanayim that lived in the time of the Beit HaMikdash, and all of these discussions we're having, not once have we referenced what the actual, a memory, a record of what the actual practice was. Finally here, where was it, nine chapters in, I think this is the first time that there's some reference to some memory of what the practice actually was in the Beit HaMikdash. So Rabbi Hanina said, my father, who was, used to push off at Bale Mumim and Gavim Nizbeach, to respond back to Rabbi Akiva, saying, Rabbi Akiva, it's all very nice, but you know, you weren't there, and I'm telling you <laughs> that at least what the practice was, my dad, if, he, if a Baal Mum made it to the altar, he would like be really adamant about making sure it got down off the altar. Like it's a very visual thing, he push it off the altar. Okay, now, Kishem Shim Alu Lo Yerdu, Kachim Yerdu Lo Yalu. The same way if it's put up, don't bring it down. If it got brought down by X, if it, if it did get brought down, you don't get a chance to bring it back up, okay? Now, that's by an invalid korban, right? If the imurim accidentally were removed, that should have been on the altar, then you put it back up on the altur. That was like the language before by, you know, machzir, k'imur, you know, et cetera. But here, anyway, if these invalid things got taken off, then they remain off. Um, now, let's say your animal walked up to the top of the altar, right? Your ba well, like ba mum doesn't count. I mean, what are these things that are, are any of these things, could they become pasul while they're balei chayim? Yeah, they're, they're over here, they're nearby. No, yeah, but those are the things that would come down even after they were shechted and put up there. That's part of the idea of psula bakodesh, all the things that are psula bakodesh, right? I mean, that's another point I guess I should have made. All the things that are psula bakodesh only can happen after, at the moment it's shechted or after it's shechted. All the things that are not psula bakodesh, right? Yeah, pretty much every single one of them happens while it's still alive. So that's actually maybe even an easier distinction that I should have said. Okay, but anyway, so all these things, if they walked up to the top of the altar, whether it's a, whether it's problematic or not problematic, you bring it down off the altar. You know, they, oh, the altar sanctified it. Let it live up on the altar. We'll bring it food every single day. <laughs> or something like that, okay? Okay, Shachta uh, okay. back. Let's say, again, some coin wasn't paying attention, whatever it was, and he figured, oh, it's too big of a prey to get this cow to come back down. I'm just gonna shecht it here. So we actually, you might remember, had an interesting question whether that was considered the north, right? When the animals have to be shechted in the north, what if you shechted at the top of the altar? But anyway, assuming that it is the north, Yafshit Yafshit don't now bring down the dead carcass and, and flay it or whatever, finish the whole process up at the top. So this last point seems to be unrelated to the issue about psalim and just tells you what, I, what do you do if an animal walks to the top of the altar. But yes, it did make me realize, as I said before, that there was an easier way of distinguishing this psula bakodesh, that the psula bakodesh are things that happen to it when it's shechted or afterwards, and the things that are more invalid that they get that they get taken off the altar are invalidities that happen while the animal is still alive. So that's an important way of, that's an easy way of seeing of drawing the line. Let's take a look at the Gemara. Tanya, we turn to Brisa. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, those he ha'ola. So this is how we know the principle that things that are brought at the top of the altar stay. We quoted this passage yesterday, right? Zos Torah ta'ola, he ha'ola, al-mokdal mizbeach kol ha'ola So he ha'ola, that is the thing that gets put up, or the ola, literally, al-mokdal mizbeach kol ha'ola, it stays on the, on, the, on, on the fire, right? It stays on the pyre. So that teaches you that things that go up stay up. Okay, there's also a pasuk which is called Nogel Bamizbeach Yiktash, which is more being evoked by the Mishnah of Mizbeach Mekadesh. But the pasuk that serves more as our basis is this pasuk. Okay, so Rabbi Yehuda excludes three things, and he excludes three things because there are three limiting words in this pasuk. Okay, which is Zot, right? He Haola. So you know, um, so this, which is only this and not something else. Um, he, this, and not something else, ha'ola, the ola, not something else, okay? Um, so, hare elo gimel miutin, these are three limiting words. 
prat l'shenishcha tablaila. If it's shecht at night, v'shenish bach dama, the blood was spilled. V'shiyatza dama chutz l'klaim, and if the blood was taken outside of the curtains, meaning outside of the azara. Now, why he picks those three is not yet clear, but that's why he is more strict than the other opinions because he focuses on those three words to exclude three things. Okay. Um, those three, if they were put up, it comes down. No, I'm going to focus on the word Ola. I only know if it's a kosher Ola. How do I know to include the places you, Rebbe Yehuda, just excluded? And now all the other cases that we both agree on. And now, okay, that's the now we're going to add cases that weren't in the Mishnah. Okay, but these are obvious because, you know, anything that's not, that's Sulo Bakodesh is okay with. Well, the same way if you spill the blood, it's okay. If you put the blood in the wrong place, the blood above you did below, below you did above. Okay. The outer blood that you put on the inside, remember we learned before that that whole thing invalidates the korban, especially if it's chatos. Okay. But again, how worse is that than spilling the blood? Okay. And then when you did outside, going back to our very first Mishnah, if you shechted shalom lishmo, how do you know in those cases? Cases, that it also it gets to stay at the top. So basically, it expanded the mist, list of the Mishnah, but it all fits into his category of Psulo Bakodesh. Torat Haola. So you, Rebbe, you to focus on Zot, He, and Haola. I focus on the word Torat. Torat means it's a general rule, it's a big category, it includes everything. Well, not the Revere, the New Roman stuff. Right. Riba Torah Chol Haolim. One for all things that get put up. Okay, and again, the word olin, therefore, being read here, not as ola like the burnt offering, but ola as anything that goes up stays up. Okay? Shim alulo yerdu. If it goes up, it, it doesn't come down. Yachal. Thank you, Michael. Shani marbe. Harovea vanirva vamuksa vanev vesen machir v'klaim v'klaim v'klaim. Oh, my God, I did it again. V'klaim v'trefa v'yotze dofen. Maybe I should include all these other things that basically become invalid, possibly even before you sanctify it, become invalid while the animal is still alive. This. So why do you use Zot? Rabbi Yehuda has more exclusions. What's your base? We don't understand Rabbi Yehuda yet, but let's understand you, Rabbi Shimon. What's your basis for excluding the things you do and including the ones that you include? So, well, I know that the Pesach included and then it excluded. Okay. You mean Ola, He, and then Ola? No, he's not focused on the He and the Ha. He's just focused on the Zot. And the oh, and the Torah, okay. Zo Torah Ola. He doesn't. He's not focused on the he and the ha. Okay. You no, know, but how do you get me to the marve? What marve is Torah. Torah includes everything. Zot is an excluding word. You have an inclusive word, an umbrella word, and an excluding word. Marbani. So here's how how I will decide to draw the line. Marbani at elu shayap suan bakodesh. I will. Like the Mishnah says, you know, it's a pretty much, it's sort of like a thing, you know, sometimes the Rishonim say, you know, use this phrase, um, the Torah makes it clear that the line's got to be drawn somewhere. From that point on, you use your own, you know, God gave you a brain for a reason, okay? So, you know, so then it was up to them to figure out where is the meaningful place to draw the line, okay? So I'm going to draw the line in something where the problem occurred once, as the phrase was used in the Mishnah, it was already, you know, accepted by the by the Kodesh, right? And the psul happened in the rituals of the Kodesh rituals, okay? Shahayu psulam Kodesh motzis, and you say, oh, shaloya psulam Kodesh, and I exclude these things, that their invalidity was not in the Kodesh. So again, it could mean it preceded the Kodesh, or it could mean, as I said, that it happened not in terms of a ritual done wrong. It was a different type of a problem that happened to it. And as uh, we clarified, like an easy way to sing, it, did it happen when it was alive or did it happen when it was dead? Okay, so that's Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon has a big umbrella inclusion, one word to exclude. He decides where to draw the line. Now, Reb Yehuda, he basically presumably agrees to this Psulan Bakodesh, but he also excludes these three other things. What is his basis for picking on these additional three things? Reb Yehuda, Maisile Mihacha. So what Reb Yehuda is going to do is, Reb Yehuda, rather than starting like everything is included, why did I exclude these three? Reb Yehuda's logic is a little bit the opposite. Reb Yehuda's logic is, I need to have an argument why I should include things. You, Rebbe Shimon, start with an assumption everything is included, right? And but you gotta you gotta exclude a category. We'll make the category Lohi Absula Bakodesh. I, Rebbe Yehuda, 
you know, start from a different approach. You know, there's a lot of things that are excluded. Zot Torah Ha'olat, Zot Hi Ha'olat. There are things that are included. I'm going to persuade me why something should be in the included category, right? Not why, why am I excluding something? No. Why should I be including something? It's a different attitude, okay? you got the basic different orientation. Wait, I'm sorry, so now we're going to say what makes him include a set of things and what leaves Mishcha Belayla, Nishpach Dama, and Yatsa Dama, what leaves those in the not included category? I'm sorry, so he disagrees. So, but he holds Rabbi Shimon's list and then has the extra three? Or Yes, not? yes. Okay. He, everything Rabbi Shimon excluded, I exclude, plus I exclude these extra three. But the way I get there is not like I'm going to make, tell you what makes these worse. The way I get there is I'm going to need something to persuade me why something should be included. Okay, and these three are going to be left on the outs. So here's what persuades me why the following things should be included. Okay, because here's the argument why I include various things. Because there's some analog to them that sometimes is kasher. And if something has an analog that is sometimes kasher, then that means it's enough in the not so terrible category that it's included in the verse that gets to let it stay Assuming on the altar. Assuming it's a real analog. What? Assuming it's a real analog. Right. Well, we'll take a look. Why, if the blood slept over, is it kasher? Because if the emurim are no tar and they were put on the altar, they get to stay. Now, how do you know that? Wait, but quick question. One more minute. Lan be emurim kasher. Now, how do you know if the emurim are no tar and they're put on the altar, they get to stay there? Shere lan kasher be basar. Because there's some type of a meat that actually is kasher the next day. Shlami meat. Of course, now the funny thing is, is that shlami meat isn't kosher on the third day. He's not going to distinguish second and third. And shlomi meat is supposed to be eaten on the second day, you know. So the, again, as Michael, you know, the, the analogs are not great. The guy's going to say, "How do you compare something that's kosher to something that's pasul?" But nevertheless, he's willing to be a little bit flexible. But he's going to say, "I need it to be in some category that I can see is not terrible." So something that stays overnight is not the worst category ever, because sometimes a korban is okay. The meat of a shlomi is okay overnight, and therefore I will say that the emurin that are overnight or the blood that's overnight is also not the worst pasul. And that gets to stay on the altar. But is this yes. not assuming that someone's been mixing it the whole time? Because otherwise, you have any questions on. No, that, no, I'm saying, is, is that. Yeah, is that I don't know. So it's, a good, it's a good question. I do not have an answer. So, so the the okay. law category is, is it was shechted, but you waited before putting the meat on the mizbeach. Before right, or before putting the blood on the mizbeach or before the angels. Correct. Around. Correct. It's just hanging around. Okay, so that's how he includes those cases. Now, um, Yotze, now how do I know if it was taken outside? Um, now, again, this is though, though only the meat and the emurim, not if the blood was taken outside. So, you would say kasher bibamat, okay? Because out in Obama, you can't. Every, everything is. Of course, the pro, besides it, that, well, besides it, there's a lot of latitude if you're going to use the Bama analog. The other problem is, to let the blood also be okay if it's brought outside. Right? This doesn't explain why are you okay with the meat and not okay with the blood. Okay? Um, so that's really not so helpful. You know, you, you were able to get the blood if it slept overnight to be kasher by a weak analog. Why can't you have the blood that's outside kasher? So it's not so great. The Gemara is going to ask on some of this. Okay? Um, tame, now, why is Tamei kasher? Because oh, that at least is better. Because when something is a korban sibor and it's tame, you can go forward. Okay. Chutzis mano. Now, why is chutzis mano okay? Because this funny idea, of course, that when something is pigul, it's only okay if everything else was done proper. And therefore, the fact that it was it was chutzis mano. In the context of Pigul, we look at it as still, it would have been Meratze. You know, in the context of Pigul, it's still Meratze in order to make something Pigul. So that weird idea that we have caught, we, you know, we go back to a lot. Okay, that means that within the Pigul world, you're in this sort of, you know, suspended reality and you still look at it as if it were Meratze. So that's why Chutzim Mano. Chutzim Komo, Hov Iskish Chutzim Komo. And Chutzim Chutzim Komo is connected to the Chutzim Mano type of an idea. It's funny, you could have said that, because you could also said that it's also miratze. The halacha that it has to be miratze is true also by a chutzim komo point. Anyway, okay. Shakibu psulim bizarkos tamo. How about if a puzzle person accepts and throws the blood? When is that ever kosher? Like if a if a if, if a kohen balmum did it or a non kohen did it or something like that, that wouldn't be that would never be good. Oh uh, well, except in the bama case. But anyway, <laughs> so the gemara says bahanach psule dechazul avodas sibor. No, we're only talking about the psulim that would be kosher for korban sibor, meaning tame. Which is not shot at all in the Mishnah, right? If we say if a puzzle Kohen accepts it, and you really don't mean puzzle, you really mean a Tomei Kohen.
tamay. Okay, you should say the word tamay. So anyway, so various the cases in the Mishnah I can somehow have some analog that I would agree with, but the cases of spilling the blood would never be kasher, even in a bummer. Taking the blood out of the out of the out of the base of mikdash, that's hard to understand why that's a, why that's worse because that is okay in the bama. And shechted at lila is also huh? What is the halacha shechita lila by a bama? Have to check that. That might be kasher also. So anyway, the, once you bring in bama, it's not so great why these are excluded. But anyway, um, so but for some reason he feels that those are not don't have enough features to be seen as shaykh to the world of being kasher, and therefore those remain pasul. So the Gemara says, um, anyway, the Gemara doesn't like it for the following reason. I don't like it for the bummer reason, but anyway. How do you apply this idea of slept over? You could also say, how do you apply this co co comparison to a bummer to these other cases? Those are cases where it's valid, and here's a case when it's invalid. How do you learn from a case where it's totally kosher because you did it the right way and say, oh, so my analog, sleeping over is not so bad because it's okay by shlomit. That, you know, that's when it's not sleeping over. That's when it's the way it's supposed to be done. So the Gemara says, Tana azotarat ola riba samech. So this is, a, the Gemara says this often, the Tana, meaning Rabbi Yehuda, is really, he's not arguing. If I started from a blank sheet, if I started, you know, if I started, you know, in a vacuum, I never would have made this analogy to think, oh, look, because shlummy meat is okay, lan is okay. Obviously, I'm not going to make that argument. There's a huge difference. But I'm starting from the fact that, that Torah Ta'olat tells me there's a category of things that get to stay on the altar. Okay, you get it? I'm not arguing because it's because leftover meat is, you know, is okay. Leftover imurim should get to stay on the altar. That's a crazy argument. What I'm arguing is since the Torah tells me there are psulim that get to stay on the altar, it's reasonable to say that it's talking about things that have some analog to kosher korbanot, okay? So it doesn't give the weight of the argument that by virtue of the comparison, it should get to stay on the altar. It gets to stay on the altar because the Torah said, Torah ha'olah, that there are psulim that stay on the altar. If I have to figure out which psulim it's talking about, I'll say it makes sense to say it's talking about the ones that have some analog to a world of things that are kosher. Okay, so that makes a, a sense. So it's tana the tana azot Torah. And Zotara Tawla is relying on the phrase that Zotara Tawla is a riba, is including Samich, that's what he's relying on. But again, it's still unconvincing because, okay, fine, I get the fact that a weak analog is enough, but I still don't get the difference between meat that goes outside and blood that goes outside. I don't get the difference, right, between the case of, uh, what do we say, um, uh, Psulim, uh, not Psulim, it was Nishka Yotza chutz and uh, what was the third one? Uh, da, 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 da. What was the third one? Nishka b'layla nishpach dama. Okay. So anyway, so the yotza chutz l'klaim is certainly a problem because that's okay by the bama. Rashi is bothered by that. Not exactly clear what the answer is. I have to check check up the one about nishka b'layla whether that's kosher. I have a feeling that might also be kosher to bama. That's a, I have to check that. Anyway, so it's still a little bit unclear why certain things remain on the outs. Anyway, now the gemara continues. Let's say you go ahead. Now we're talking about Shkutei Chutz. Rabbi Yochanan likes to talk about Shkutei Chutz for some reason. Is there a connection between? Or we're, just moving we're moving on. We're done with where they get it from. Now we're moving on to discuss interesting halachot that, you know, derive from the, this principle. Okay? Which principle? Well, from the rule that certain things get to stay on the altar. Okay. Okay. So Rabbi Yochanan says, Let's say you shech the behem at night. Now he's talking here, even according to Rabbi Yehuda, that would say it does not get to stay on the altar. Okay, so actually this is based wait, on according to Rabbi Shimon. No, even according to Rabbi Yehuda, that says oh, you shech. Yo right, 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 right. Rabbi Yochanan, but he's talking according to the Rabbi Yehuda who we just said in the Mishnah. Rabbi Yochanan's an Amora. Okay, if you shech it at night, and we're talking even within Rabbi Yehuda, that would say that you would not get to keep it on the altar, and nevertheless. Uh, if you then brought it outside, you then brought the, the, the meat of it and you put it on, an, on, a, on, an, on a bama, on a private outer, altar outside, you shechted it inside the basement fish at night. So this is such a bad invalidity that for Rebbe Yehuda, I, I don't mean that for Rebbe Yehuda, it would come off the altar. If you put the meat, you shechted it at night in the basement fish. If you were to put the meat on the altar, it would have to come off. 
What you did with the meat is you walked it out of the base of Mikdash and you put it on your private altar. So are you chayav for bringing something on a private altar? Because you could say, but well, I'm chayav and bringing something on a private altar, I'm bringing it to God, not to a bazaar. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm chayav if it's something that could have been brought in the base of Mikdash. But at this stage, at least according to Rebbe Yehuda, it could have been brought in the Beit HaMikdash, because even if I put the meat on the altar, I would have to take it down. Nevertheless, says Rabbi Yochanan, you're chayef for Ha'alas Chutz. You're chayef for bringing it out of the Beit HaMikdash. Chaya, you're chayef. Why? Lo tehei p'chusa mishochet p'chutz umala b'chutz. Because shechting it at night in the Beit HaMikdash, let's say I took my korban and I shechted it out of the Beit HaMikdash, and I put the meat on the altar. What would you say? Would I get to keep the meat on? Just what, intuitively, what do you think? I shechted my korban outside the Beit HaMikdash. No, absolutely not, right? That's like, low, that's a case of lo hai apsula b'kodesh, even going to Rabbi Shimon, right? It wasn't Mikabel. The problem happened way out there, right? So Rabbi Yochanan says, okay, that's really bad. And if the meat was put on the altar, it has to come down. Now let's think about what happens if you did that on your private bummer. You shechted the korban outside the base of Mikdash and you put the meat on. Are you high for putting the meat on? You're high for shechting too. But you know, me, you know, me and David here are going to have a, you know, gonna do it in partnership here. We're gonna bring our korban outside the base of Mikdash. So I shecht it, I'm chayev, and David puts the meat on. David's chayev also, right? For putting the meat on an altar out of the base of Mikdash. Even though from the moment I shechted it, the meat never could have been put on the altar. So Rabbi Yochanan says it's no different here. You shechted it in the base of Mikdash, okay. At night, fine, the shechita was a terrible shechita, the meat would have come down the altar. Nevertheless, the meat put on an altar out of the base of Mikdash is still considered, you're still chai for, because it's no worse than shechting the whole animal outside the base of Mikdash, okay? So, lotei p'chusa mishokei p'chutz umale b'chutz, okay? So that's a pretty reasonable argument. So, Masi Rabbi Chibarabin, Rabbi Chibarabin asked on this. I show a oaf bifnim umale b'chutz. We have a... Uh, teaching later on. I don't know if it's a mission. It might be a mission. Ben, hold on. Check. Yeah, it's a Mishnah. If you shecht a bird inside the base of Mikdash and then put the meat on an altar outside, patur, you're exempt. Shachat pachutz umala pachutz chayav. If you both shechted it outside and put it on the altar outside, you're chayav. So this Rabbi Yochanan is exactly your 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 paradox, your irony, right? And the Allah is in achinami. If you did the shechita and the putting it outside, you're chayim. If you did the shechita on the inside and the putting it on the outside, you're potter. Is it ironic? Yes. But in a certain way, it makes sense. If you're doing, like, in the context of doing it on the outside, we sort of bracket the fact, sort of like people, we bracket the fact that it's outside. You know, it's like, oh, you already shechted it outside. Now it's already pasul. Like, we're already in the context of doing everything outside. So if you shecht it and bring it outside, you're chayim. But if you shecht it inside and you invalidate it, okay, and then you put the meat outside, you're patur. So this is exactly the opposite of what you said, Rabbi Yochanan. Right? You got it? Okay. So he says, Tiyufta. So, so I'm sorry, name, according to you, Rabbi Yochanan, why don't we say, Lote p'chusa mishochet imal b'chutz? So why don't we say, no, if you, in that case, you shechted the bird on the inside and you put it on the outside, let's say that you are, um, let's say you're chayav. It's no worse than if you did them both on the outside, okay? Tyufta. That's a contradiction to Rabbi Yochanan. Ibaisem, if you want, I could say it's quite fascinating. It says tyufta and then it says ibaisem. Like, normally tyufta is <laughs> like the end of the conversation. Okay, end of discussion. <laughs> you totally, you totally contradict Rabbi Yochanan. If you want, you could say, <laughs> if you want, you could say, No, here's what, there's a difference. There we're talking about a bird. Okay, remember, birds, what do they, what do you do with a bird inside the Beit HaMikdash? You do Malika, right? So therefore, by a bird, in a bird, if you shecht it on the inside, the reason it's puzzle on the outside is yes. Shechita of a bird on the inside is worse than shechita on the outside. Because shechita on the inside is like completely not the right way to kill it. Okay, it's basically like, you know, it's basically like, you know, shooting it in the head. Okay, there's no meaning to the act of shechita. In the inside the base, I make this with a bird, there's only meaning to an act of malik. Okay. okay. Shechita is not a general word. It's a specific word about how to slaughter the animal. I mean, well, no, you did do shita. No, no, it does not mean malika. Correct, right. correct. So, like uh, correct, correct, correct. Right. So therefore, yeah. right. So therefore, when you act, if if you were to like, you know, if you shecht it, okay, 
So if you do an act of shechita, which is a recognized act of shechita, whether it's on the outside or it's on the inside and it's at night or whatever, Rabbi Yochanan says, that's all considered an act of shechita. And therefore, even if it's a puzzle act of shechita, you're chayiv when you put the meat on the altar. Because again, the puzzle of night is not worse than the psul of shechting it outside the base of mikdash. And then you'd be chayiv if it's an animal, not a bird. I keep saying an animal, a mammal, okay, not a bird. But by a bird, if you shecht it on the inside, you might as well have shot it in the head. It wasn't a meaningful act of a shechita. It wasn't just psul, pasul. It was completely like you didn't shecht it. And that's why when you put the meat on the outside altar, it is going to be a patur because you never even did an act of shechita on this. Okay, so that's what Rabbi Yochan says. But I got to tell you, I certainly understand the opposite position. I say, I could argue, yes, shechting it at night inside is worse, by, even by a cow or sheep, than shechting it outside. Not that it's really worse, but that when you shecht it inside, we're looking at it through the lens of a korban, and we say you invalidated it. And now that you've invalidated it, if you put the meat on an altar outside, you're not chayev. Whereas when you shecht it outside, the lens we're looking at it through, the primary lens is that, oh, did you just invalidate your korban? The primary lens we're looking at when you shecht it outside is, did you do an act of bringing a korban outside the base of mikdash? And the answer is yes. And then the next act of putting it up was part of that process as well. Right, so there is actually an argument to argue by Rabbi Yochanan that yes, shechting and bringing outside is chayev, shechting at night inside and bringing outside is patra. But the Gemara, Rabbi Yochanan says, no, they're the same, you're, pat, you're chayev in both cases. And the Mishnah was talking about a bird, and a bird is a special circumstance. Okay, so I guess we'll end here, um, so we don't get too far ahead, um, and we'll pick up with it.